When you think of iconic Yu-Gi-Oh cards, Exodia the Forbidden One is always near the top of the list. It's one of the game's most popular monsters, there were memes created around him, hell loads of people that have never even played the Yu-Gi-Oh TCG still know the name. However, despite all the name recognition and fanfare the monster gets, most of us know Exodia exclusively as a casual or anime fan deck. Seriously, go search far and wide throughout the entire history of the TCG and you'll be hard pressed to find an Exodia deck winning any high level tournament of note. As someone who has played Yu-Gi-Oh for 20 years and considers himself a historian of it, off the top of my head, I can't remember any Shonen Jump Tops, great performances at YCS events, or stunning wins at a national season tournament. But what if I told you there was once a time in history when Exodia was undoubtedly the best deck in the game and was literally god tier? As unbelievably impossible as that sounds, that's the cold hard truth and in this video you'll learn all about it. In addition, how that Exodia deck worked, why it dominated, and when that time was. One more quick thing, just before anyone tries to correct me, I am fully aware that Jarrell Winston got 5th place at the World Championship while playing Exodia in 2012, but Worlds is just kinda weird, there's only like 24 people there, it's an invite only event, and it's not like he used Exodia to qualify for Worlds, he used Chaos Dragons for that. Anyways, before we dive into the story, if you like Yu-Gi-Oh! history or enjoy my videos in general, then please help the channel grow by giving the video a like, commenting your thoughts below, subscribe Subscribing if you haven't already and by sharing the video with your friends on social media. Some watching this video may already be confused. Cap, you just said Exodia never topped any big prestigious tournament in the TCG, but then you turn around and claim that it was in fact the best deck at some point. How in the heck can these two conflicting statements both be true? Well, to answer that question, I'm gonna have to go back further than I ever have in any Yu-Gi-Oh! video. Before even I started playing this game, and before the TCG existed, we're gonna have to go to a time that, full disclosure, I am not an expert on. We need to travel back to 1999, years before the TCG, before I ever heard the word Yu-Gi-Oh!, a time when the OCG was just getting started and when this game was truly in its infancy. The OCG launch of Yu-Gi-Oh! was far different from the TCG one. The first OCG Yu-Gi-Oh! booster sets featured no effect monsters in them at all and had really basic names after numbered volumes. The Exodia set was also released in a drastically different way from what we know in the TCG, where all 5 pieces were ultra rares in our first core booster set, Legend of Blue Eyes White Dragon. In the OCG, Konami released them in honestly a pretty scummy way. The pieces were not only staggered, with the left leg premiering first in Volume 3 on May 27th and the right leg following it in Volume 4 about two months later, but the pieces weren't even all contained in booster sets. The right and left arm were promos for the first and second guides for the Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters 2 Dark Duel Stories video game, meaning that you had to get both of the guides to get each card. Just like in the TCG, every Exodia piece was initially printed in Ultra Rare, and Konami clearly knew these pieces would be highly desired, hence the decision to place each one in a different product. However, the most important piece, Exodia the Forbidden One, aka the head of Exodia, could only be obtained in the Premium Pack, which exclusively premiered at the disastrous Tokyo Dome event on August 26, 1999. I don't want to bury the lead here, and I've got a completely separate video planned for this event, so I'll come back to that story later. Let's just say getting an Exodia set during that time in Japan was incredibly difficult, and to obtain one, you either had to be lucky as hell, or you would have had to spend a ton of money. Duelists were massively hyped for the chance to get to play the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG's first ever alternative win condition, and the card pool was just advanced enough to give them the cards to accomplish that. While the volume sets were the real superstars that Duelists anticipated for new powerhouse cards like Pot of Greed, Regeki, Trap Hole, and Monster Reborn, the numbered booster sets would sometimes give them a nice surprise. Booster Set 4 released the same day as the premium pack that gave players Exodia the Forbidden One, and this set was a surprising blockbuster that gave players some insanely powerful cards like Gemini Elf, Mechanical Chaser, and the all-powerful Graceful Charity. This card's addition into the card pool is what largely led to pure Exodia decks being viable upon release in late August. 
Pot of Greed and Graceful Charity as massive draw cards combined with Swords of Revealing Light to stall your opponent's offense meant Pure Exodia could sometimes be fast enough to win within maybe the first five turns of the duel, especially when you consider that all these powerful spell cards were completely unlimited at the time Add on top of that, Magician of Faith, which was released in Volume 4, who could recycle all the cards. Exodia sounded nice on paper, and if you could somehow obtain them, you could run three of all the pieces, which ironically wasn't actually the smartest idea. Exodia still struggled finding solid main deck monsters that synergize with the win condition. As a side note, Harpy's Feather Duster was also a huge pain for the deck as it was an excellent counter to the deck's primary stall card in Swords of Revealing Light, and Feather Duster was unlimited at this time. The deck was formidable, but it just wasn't good enough to be the top dog. Also, dedicated Exodia decks, as mentioned, were really tough to build, if for no other reason than the pieces. They were just really hard to get, especially the head of Exodia so this made it not very popular at the time, at least from a competitive standpoint. But then something changed. In mid-November, the 18th to be exact, Volume 6 was released. Despite featuring polymerization as the only spell in the entire set, this booster entry is what utterly broke the Exodia deck. Volume 6 premiered both Witch of the Black Forest and Sangan, along with the powerful counter traps we know in the TCG came from our second core booster, Metal Raiders. Sangan and Witch of the Black Forest were utterly meta-shattering cards upon their release. When this card is placed in the graveyard, add 1,500 or less of a monster from your deck to your hand and shatter your deck. If you're a TCG duelist, you probably already know how strong these cards were in the past based on their time spent on the ban list and the erratas they received meant the week in the cards. However, what you might not know is that the original OCG text of both cards was a complete far cry from what we received in the TCG. Disregard any small translating errors. Even as a Yu-Gi-Oh! boomer, I have to admit, I was completely shocked to learn that originally, Sangan and Witch of the Black Forest would both trigger when reaching the graveyard, no matter how they got there. Yep, no needing to hit the field required. This was insane for the time, and the biggest implication was that these cards were basically gold mines when it came to discard fodder. Imagine, if you will, activating a graceful charity to draw three cards, then discarding a witch and a sangan and immediately searching two pieces of Exodia for free. Now imagine adding Pot of Greed to make things even faster and easier, then playing three of all these cards because the OCG's limit regulation at that time was only three cards itself. Dark Hole, Regeki, and Trap Hole. It should go without saying, but post the release of Volume 6, Exodia skyrocketed to being the unquestioned best deck of the meta. What you see before you is an example deck list. The deck was super fast, consistent, had removal for opposing monsters, was completely immune to the devastating Crush Card virus, and most importantly, could sometimes win outright on the opening turn of the duel something that the good stuff beatdown deck simply couldn't. This was also a time when mounting offense came slow, so even in the event that Exodia didn't win super fast, the good stuff beatdown deck just didn't have enough pushing power to fatally punish them in a single turn. Exodia also abused the format warping Witch of the Black Forest and Sangan the best of all the decks available at the time. Sure, other decks could use Graceful Charity and Tribute to the Doom in combination with those cards for searches, but with Exodia, those plays directly led you to your win condition, which again could be accomplished before your opponent even got a chance to play. For these reasons, Exodia now stood alone atop at the meta, but as fate would have it, the deck hadn't quite reached its full potential. Not yet. Exodia's absolute prime and dominance came a month later with the release of the EX Starter Box. Inside of it was the first printing of a card that figuratively, and I guess literally, removed any shackles and restraints the Exodia deck had on it. Last Will was that card. We all know how earth-shatteringly powerful Last Will was in the TCG, but again, what most don't know is that it mirrored Sangan and Witch. 
in which its original printing was stupidly more powerful than later ones. Just like in the TCG, the first printing of Last Will allowed a player the ability to use its effect unlimitedly during the turn you activated and resolved it. The only thing you needed to do was continually meet the condition of having one of your monsters go to the graveyard. Last Will could be played before or after your monster went to the grave to use its effect, and if you played two copies of the card, well, you got to summon two monsters. Last Will pushed Exodia's ceiling through the roof, as the card allowed easy OTKs even when going second. This was achieved by activating the spell, then ramming a Sangan or Witch of the Black Forest into one of your opponent's attack position monsters. You would then summon another copy via Last Will's effect during the battle phase, and after each attack, you'd get a search for an Exodia piece. Do this five times, and it was game over for your opponent. If you were going first, it could be used in conjunction with Cannon Soldier. This created a full-on FTK if Cannon Soldier launched Sangan or Witch, and you had Last Will in hand. Keep in mind, at this point, players had largely opted to drop Regeki from the main deck to exclusively play Dark Hole, as it could trigger Sangan, Last Will, and Witch during the opening turn. Getting Witch or Sangan on the field, as well as Cannon Soldier, wasn't very difficult. In fact, I'd argue that it was laughably easy, thanks to Monster Reborn being at 3. Also, while new rulings would eventually make it so that Sangan and Witch Suicide OTKs were impossible, the original Last Will allowed players to summon in the damage step and also during the battle phase. This new build of Exodia was so consistent and powerful, it not only led to the good stuff beatdown deck becoming completely unviable and dying out, but it also led to a full-on tier 0 Exodia format. To be frank, offensive plays at that time simply weren't advanced enough to keep up with the pace of Exodia and its numerous ways of exploiting OG prints of cards like Sangan, Last Will, and Witch of the Black Forest. Players even dropped cards like Skellingale and Change of Heart because they simply weren't needed anymore. Honestly, this OTK Tier 0 madness probably would have continued, except Konami heard the complaints of the players who were sick of a die roll format and decided to bring down the hammer. In February 2000, Konami introduced the first real and full-on limit regulation list for the OCG, and they went after Exodia pretty hard. All five pieces were limited, as well as Pot of Greed and Last Will. Konami also semi-limited Graceful Charity and Monster Reborn. They were clearly trying to send a message to the players that they were going to try to crack down on the Exodia degeneracy. And with that, we are at the conclusion of our story, or I guess I should say this part of the story, because technically, there's a lot more to Exodia's run in the OCG. Again, I don't think a lot of TCG players even know about this. If you want to see more of this story, including how slash if players adapted, you know what to do. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, or more importantly, you learned something. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Subscribe if you have not already. Share this video with your friends on social media, and thank you for watching as always.